Hello and welcome. My name is Forrest Longman and I am the president of City Club. The mission of City Club is to inform, connect, and engage our community to strengthen the civic health of our region. We emphasize civil conversations and listening to others. We begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people and it has been this way since time immemorial. As always, I'd like to thank all our volunteers who make our programs possible. I'd also like to thank KMRE radio board member Robert Clark, who's producing today's program, and BTV10, who will be broadcasting it to their viewers. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for their support. They are Bruce and Claudia Dyson, the Opportunity Council, Baron Smith Dogger, Attorneys at Law, Lummi Commercial Company, Danny Neal of the Muyak Group, Colshan CPAs, Pacific Continental Realty, Unity Care Northwest, Village Books, Western Washington University, Wacom Community College, and the Wacom Community Foundation. Our June City Club program will be titled Medical Equity or Private Equity. Will Wall Street be running our healthcare system? Finally, I'd like to turn things over to Tim Douglas. Tim is a former mayor of Bellingham, a member of our City Club program committee. He'll introduce our speaker and moderate today's program. Tim? Thanks very much, Forrest. Uh, I look forward to this program and have for some time ever since this tragic war, uh, the invasion by Russia of Ukraine uh, began and we just continue to watch it unfolding. Uh, I wanted to comment before, just before introducing our guest uh, that I did have an opportunity myself to serve as director of the US Peace Corps in Russia. We had over 200 volunteers spread all across the entire uh, country of Russia. I had a chance to visit so many places there and to become acquainted with many Russians uh, and talk with them about day-to-day -day events as well as other things. So, and I've been back there since. So there are a few things I've experienced and uh, feel it might be worthwhile talking about, but we're going to have this in a conversational style. So as those seem appropriate, I'll offer them. So let me introduce our guest. John Koenig retired after in 2015, after more than three decades in the US Foreign Service. He served as political advisor to the UN or the uh, NATO Joint Forces Command, which oversaw allied operations in the Mediterranean and the Balt Balkans. He served as deputy permanent representative, boy, that's a mouthful, but deputy permanent rep representative to the US mission in NATO as it expanded its operations in Afghanistan and ex extended its outreach into the Middle East. In 2011, Ambassador Koenig uh, received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award, uh, an, an outstanding recognition uh, for the policy and leadership role he played at US NATO and in both our Cyprus and uh, Berlin embassies. Mr. Kudert received an MA in International Affairs at Johns Hopkins University, and he currently lectures at the University of Washington Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. Mr. Ambassador, welcome again to City Club. We're delighted to have you here. This uh, situation in the Ukraine has been unfolding now for some time. And we fortunately, you as an ambassador to NATO and your other roles have had an opportunity to watch the events leading up to the Russian invasion. And then as things have continued to unfold, you've developed, I know, a number of insights into it. So we're really uh, pleased to have you here today. We hope you'll help us shed some light, a better understanding of the complexities of this situation and its implication for the world situation and particularly for peace in the world in the future. So, Ambassador Koenig. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I would also like to thank Forrest and City Club for giving me this opportunity. I've been looking forward to this for a while as well, ever since we first talked. So thanks for thinking of me 
to uh, discuss this topic with all of the people here today. Um, I hope that, uh, Tim, you will uh, jump in later uh, to talk about your personal experience in Russia. It did come at a pivotal time. Of course, those first several years of, of Vladimir Putin's uh, leadership of Russia are now considered uh, kind of a key period in the evolution of Russia and uh, Russia's relations with the West. Uh, so I think that your insights will be very valuable. I, I want to present some ideas about what is going on in uh, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine and the war in Ukraine and the international reaction um, in a set of themes. And I think it's extremely useful after now three full months of this invasion, just to touch on a few key themes in order to stimulate thinking, I hope stimulate questions and uh, address some of the most important dimensions I, I, that I would say have not been uh, adequately addressed in uh, most media coverage of the conflict as well as the, the big story that the media has helped to tell. Um, so I'm going to go through these themes one by one and I will undoubtedly leave some out and I hope that people will step in with comments and questions later in order to make sure that we don't miss those things. Um, first, I wanna talk a little bit about the causes of this situation and the causes of this conflict. Clearly, the number one cause of this conflict, the main cause, the most substantial and immediate cause was Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. This was a massive violation of international law and the conduct of this invasion has been um, brutal. It has uh, caused massive human casualties and, and physical destruction in Ukraine. Uh, and it is very much fits the pattern of Russian military activity uh, in conflicts, first in Chechnya, inside Russia, then in Georgia in 2008, Crimea and the Donbass in 2014, and then after that in Syria. This brutal, uh, excessively sort of uh, aggressive, uh, destructive type of war. But there's another story behind this particular story, and that is the unsettled legacy of the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you really could hardly look at this war in isolation from this history that, that uh, preceded it. The much is made about differences of view that exist in the West and elsewhere regarding the effect of the encroachment of NATO in particular, uh, and to a lesser degree, the European Union towards Russia's borders. There were two major enlargements of NATO that affected Russian interests. First was in 1999, and the second was in 2004. And that one, the 2004 enlargement, brought NATO to the borders of Russia. And then there were other events in this uh, nature that occurred later, the 2008 Bucharest decision of NATO to invite essentially, without any specific date, uh, Georgia and Ukraine to join the alliance, which has had provoked a, a great deal of unrest in that region. Uh, I think it's also important to point out that one reason that this conflict is probably happening is the relative weakening of the US and the West in the global scheme of things over the past 20 years. Um, so I raise these uh, more remote causes because uh, I know that they're controversial, but I believe that they have a heavy impact on how we propose to protect our interests in, as this conflict moves forward and as the solution is sought. The, this background, I think, is quite relevant to discussion of how this war might end, and we'll get to that later. Second theme is surprises. Um, there weren't very many surprises in this conflict, I hate to say it. But so far, the only real serious surprise that I have seen is the strength of Ukrainian resistance and in a way, the flip side of that, the poor performance of Russian forces. This was not expected by any analyst as far as I know. I don't think anyone thought that the Ukrainian forces would be able to fight Russia to a standstill, prevent the conquest of let's say Kharkiv in addition to uh, Kyiv and that kind of thing. This means that Russia will not achieve its initial war aims, and that's important to bear in mind. Russia sought 
regime change in Kiev. It wanted a new kind of government more favorably disposed toward Moscow to be put in place. And that is not going to happen in this conflict. Uh, there are a lot of other startling events that have happened in Ukraine over the last three months, needless to say. The war crimes and crimes against humanity, the indiscriminate bombing you know, of targets, including civilian targets, the active Russian disinformation campaign, its appeal evidently to the Russian population, which generally supports the war. Uh, Europe's reaction has been strong. China's position has been interesting. Uh, the disinterest in most of the rest of the world has been notable, but none of it is very surprising. And I'm also not very surprised that the US is getting ever more deeply involved in this war and raising the stakes to some extent inappropriately, I think. It, that fits a pattern in my experience and I think we'll touch on that later. Uh, Tim asked me to talk a little bit about Putin's character and I think that's important to address. He's uh, clearly a dictator. He has uh, managed to sort of undermine Russian democracy over the time that he's been in office so that even though the forms of democracy persist, in fact, it's an authoritarian regime which has little respect for human rights as we all know. But I think the key to uh, looking at the character of Vladimir Putin is to ascertain that he is a bad man, but not a madman. Um, uh, I think that is critical to how we handle this conflict. I was in the room, by the way, at the New York Security Conference back in 2007, when Putin essentially read the riot act to the US and the West that any further encroachment toward Russia's borders by NATO or the EU or any further disregard of Russia's role in global affairs would have very serious consequences that Russia would react essentially violently. We didn't pay a lot of attention to that back then. Uh, we also need, of course, to consider Putin's regime, which is corrupt and uh, has a very difficult time uh, digesting information, so it's not efficient. These have also contributed a great deal to the uh, outcome of the conflict so far. Uh, clearly, uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine was a grave miscalculation on his part. That said, he still seems to be acting rationally, even if brutally. You can see that in the way that the Russian operation has evolved. It is not a complete failure. It has failed to achieve its initial objectives. It has adjusted. It seems to be rational, but brutal. So let me just reiterate, Putin is a bad man, but not a madman. This is cr very crucial, I think, to how we approach this conflict, because if Putin is genuinely not rational, then the stakes and risks of the conflict would be immeasurably worse than they appear right now. So, um, what are these risks? And I think risk is kind of the field in which I operate, assessing risk as an analyst. Um, in the short term, there are two countervailing risks that have been discussed a great deal, essentially debated in the media, uh, and also among all of the talking heads, many of whom I think we all listen to. Um, and then there is a growing risk that I'll touch on later in the medium term. The first short-term risk is appeasement. And this has gotten a lot of attention. The notion that this is like Munich in 1938 and the United States has to be Churchill and not Neville Chamberlain. Um, our reaction, however, has been so firm that I think this, this risk is kind of off the table at this point. But I think it was always overstated. The events of the last three months anyway, I think should put to rest this notion that Putin will move on from any conceivable thing that he could label as a success in Ukraine to attempting the conquest of other states. Russia is simply too weak. Uh, the evasion has been too much of a mess. Um, I don't think he's as great a threat as we portray him to be in terms of other conflicts uh, and a grander scheme to conquer the West. Still, there are many um, who seem to label any caution whatsoever that we have toward how we escalate on our side or support the escalation of this conflict as appeasement or our self-deterrence. I think that's not a rational way to discuss what we are doing in that regard. The second short-term risk, however, is very important right now, and that is the risk of escalation and a wider conflict. And that would potentially involve, as I think we all know, nuclear weapons, including a general war that is nuclear, which is the worst possible. Um, from the beginning, 
consciousness about this risk has guided US policy. And that is why there has been such heavy emphasis on these guidelines or guardrails that the Biden administration has applied. They're very rational. There should be no direct military engagement between US and NATO forces and Russian forces, for example. There should be a kind of discussion and a assessment of providing military and other assistance to Ukraine to ensure that we're not contributing to an escalation or a widening war. And uh, there should be greater emphasis on economic sanctions and political isolation than only war fighting because we want this to be addressed without any further involvement, direct involvement of Western forces. In the last few weeks, the US uh, and NATO seem to have abandoned some of their restraint on this score and have spoken in sort of unofficial uh, settings, but also occasionally from senior officials in the US government about wider anti-Russian objectives in this war. And Russia at the same time has spoken more and more about nuclear options in the war. So I think the risk is real and growing that there will be a wider conflict or escalation as both sides tend to ignore the guardrails as this conflict exists. Now for Ukraine, there is a tremendous uh, risk in the lengthening of this war. There's a growing risk that this bloody war uh, will uh, destroy the country to such a degree, especially in the East and the South, that it could take decades for Ukraine to recover. In that case, victory, if we're talking about victory, and I don't think we should be, but victory will be hard to achieve and potentially hard to rationalize against the costs of achieving it. And in the medium to long term, I think there's another very important risk that is particularly one that Americans need to be aware of. And that is, the risk of a new Cold War. I think this has come to be kind of accepted as a necessity in, internet, in American security policy, but I think it's something that is not inevitable and we should be trying to avoid it if at all possible. I actually have some experience of the first Cold War. I was assigned to East Germany during the first Cold War. So I know a little bit about what that was like. And uh, I've also read a great deal about the uh, Cold War. We have already begun to move down a path in that direction, I'm afraid but I think that's dangerous and may really be unnecessary. So to my mind, portraying the Ukraine war as part of a broader sort of epochal conflict between democracy and authoritarianism, authoritarianism is, a, is a direct path to a new Cold War and it is a mistake. Let me turn now to NATO. What is the meaning for NATO uh, of this uh, crisis and this invasion and war? Well, Russia's invasion and its brutal behavior in Ukraine have really solidified the perception in Europe that Russia poses a threat. This is something that really came to the fore in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the military intervention in the Donbas region of Ukraine, but now it is firmly implanted. NATO and Europe are more united than they have been in years around a, a common threat perception, which is very important to the functioning of NATO and the alliance. This is most evident, I would say, in the rapid evolution, the sort of revolution in German security policy, uh, and also in the decisions by Finland and Sweden, two longtime non-aligned military powers in Europe to apply for membership in NATO, so to do away with non-alignment. The US actually is, should not take too much credit for this. It's not our doing, it is Putin's doing. He is the one, by posing a threat, who has driven these countries to uh, find unity of purpose in reacting against this threat and in showing more solidarity with each other in terms of defense. Over time, however, this unity is likely to diminish uh, as the economic and social effects of the war at home in each of these countries become more serious and they begin to affect political attitudes based on relative exposure or distance from the conflict or relative exposure or distance from the spillover effects. We've begun to see a bit of that here, by the way, but in the most notable, I would say, in terms of lack of uh, solidarity or unity of purpose uh, in this uh, scheme is Turkey, which has raised objections to fast tracking NATO accession by Sweden and Finland. I would be happy to talk about that a little bit more. It's been a long time in that part of the world. Um, and Hungary, which has so far blocked the ban on oil imports from Russia that all other members of the European Union seem to support. Many would say, I think, that the Ukraine war has proven 
that the US must remain central to Europe's defense. I would say not quite. It has proven it in a way, but not in another. It is true that it has shown uh, that the American nuclear umbrella is critical as a deterrent in the face of Russia's nuclear threats. The United States is the nuclear umbrella through something called uh, secondary deterrence or extended deterrence for our European allies. And that is crucial under these circumstances. The US has also played a critical role in mustering support for Ukraine and uh, in taking measures to support uh, frontline NATO allies against threats might, that might emanate from Russia. But the war has also revealed Russia's military limitations, and that's equally important. Clearly, our European NATO allies collectively can easily uh, obtain, if they don't have it already, the capacity to cope with Russia's conventional capabilities. I think that is beyond doubt. European armies could fight and win a conventional war against this Russian army that invaded Ukraine. And the trend toward greater European defense spending suggests that these allies, the Europeans, can take over more responsibility for their own defense. And I think we should want that. So what should we want? What are the US objectives in this war? That's my next theme. I think everyone would agree that the US objective should be to end this conflict as soon as possible on terms that are acceptable to Ukraine. That I think is critical. That is the central position of Western countries in regard to this conflict. At the same time, the United States, which has invested so much in this conflict already, and our NATO and EU allies should each have their own objectives as well. And here there is a great divergence between two different schools of thought in the United States. This is most evident in visions for the post-Ukraine European security order. There is one group, a very influential group, perhaps the dominant group in the United States, that believes that this new order should punish Russia in the long term and not just until it modifies its behavior in Ukraine. It should focus on the nature of the Putin regime and at the extreme, even pursue regime change in Russia. It would not, for example, lift sanctions if Russia were to withdraw from Ukraine. This school thought believes that Ukraine, however, can join the European Union and possibly even NATO after the war. And that Russia must be weakened and its capacity to influence events in, its, in the countries along its borders should be not just diminished, but essentially erased. Advocates of this position have even argued that NATO should have enlarged earlier to include Ukraine so that we would have been forced to sort of defend Ukraine against the Russian aggression. And this kind of thinking was also reflected in the rather odd comment that Secretary of, Secretary of Defense Austin made after visiting Kyiv in late April that Russia must be weakened so it can never do anything like this again. That's, this is very serious territory we're getting into when we say things like that. Um, the second group, of which I am a supporter, you won't be surprised, uh, believes the new order should seek to avoid the mistakes of the past and find a way to better accommodate conflicting security interests, including those of Russia to a degree, so that we do not confront this problem again and again. So there are two different approaches to how to avoid confronting this problem again. One is to seek to accommodate to some way, in some way Russia's clear security concerns, uh, they're evident because Russia actually invaded Ukraine in order to uh, sort of uh, rep, uh, improve its security, strangely enough. And the other is that you have to weaken Russia so that it no longer factors in the European security equation. The school that I belong to takes the view that the US does not want to increase its overseas securities com security commitments, especially not in Europe where our allies, as I said, are fully capable of defending the continent from Russia's conventional threats. And for me, there is a growing concern that advocates of the first approach are encouraging Ukraine to downgrade efforts to toward a negotiated solution, either temporary or permanent. They seem to be pulling the Biden uh, administration toward more and more ambitious, though in unclear war aims. And I think this is a dangerous trend. I now want to turn to some spillover effects because I think this conflict has had already very dramatic spillover effects and those are likely to increase and to affect us more and more. Uh, first, there's the humanitarian dimension. And I think it's important to bear in mind that the greatest humanitarian catastrophe is inside Ukraine. 
uh, where as many as 8 million persons out of a pre-war population of 44 million are internally displaced and cities, towns, and infrastructure have been devastated. And there have been a large number unknown, but tens of thousands of casualties. Uh, there's also the flow of refugees out of Ukraine, which has reached more than 5 million and is straining the capacity of receiving states, uh, even Poland, which has opened its doors to Ukrainians fleeing the war. And this will be a uh, serious uh, challenge that we will need to meet over years, I think, not just months. Um, turning now to the economic dimension, uh, once again, the destruction of Ukraine is the most dramatic economic consequence of this war. Ukraine's GDP will shrink probably 30 to 40% this year. And its infrastructure and buildings have been devastated. So the national wealth of Ukraine, not just its GDP, but the national wealth of Ukraine has been severely destroyed. The crippling of the Russian economy, by the way, is also a major economic effect of the war. It's an intended consequence of the international response to Russia's invasion and our sanctions, but it is something worth noting. The broader damage to the world economy is mounting, however. The IMF has reduced already two months ago, actually, reduced its forecast of global growth by more than a percentage point down from 3.6% as a result of the war and its effects. And inflation is being fed by a variety of factors, but among the most important are energy and other commodity shortages that are a consequence of this war and the sanctions regimes. And the US economy is by no means immune. Our own GDP shrank in the first quarter by 1.4%, and inflation is at a 40-year high, as I think we all know. Uh, the financial and commodity market volatility is almost unprecedented, and it's amplified by the uncertainty of the Ukraine war. And fears of recession are mounting in America and Europe while we devote ever more resources to Ukraine and sanctions. We seem to be sometimes almost throwing money at Ukraine as a way of reacting to this situation. We've, we've allocated $54 billion in the past two months alone, which is an extraordinary sum. The unintended effects of the war and sanctions are not felt evenly, of course. The greatest burden will fall on vulnerable groups here at home, for sure, but especially the poor in the Middle East and North Africa, where shortages of grain and fertilizer and fuel price increases could bite hard, cause famine, and potentially unrest. Finally, I want, I want to touch on the energy dimension because it's very important. And I, I chose to put it in, in, a, in spillover effects rather than treat it as a separate theme, but it could be either one. Um, I decided to discuss it here uh, because while in the short term, Russian oil and gas exports are a battleground over the resources that Russia has to wage this war, including uh, there is much more at stake for the world than the outcome of the Ukraine conflict. The energy dimension of this conflict is bigger than the conflict itself in some ways. In the context of the Ukraine war, Western countries, including the US, are trying to choke off Russian energy export revenues. This has led Europe and even Germany, a country that had not tried very seriously to limit its dependence on Russian gas in particular, to set a goal of curtailing Russian oil imports by the end of this year and working hard to reduce imports of Russian natural gas. As I mentioned at this time, Hungary is standing in the way of the oil ban. These moves are dramatic, but I think they will have less impact than one might expect. For oil, which can quite easily be shifted from one customer to another, the war has helped raise global oil prices. Meanwhile, Russia has been able to find markets in India and other places to pick up the slack left by Europe and Saudi Arabia and other Gulf oil producers have not moved to increase production so that prices have not come down. In the end, Russia can turn, continues to earn about as much or actually more from oil exports as it did before the invasion of Ukraine. For natural gas, the problem is very different. Natural gas is not at all like oil in terms of delivery and, and investment. Natural gas is in fact abundant globally. And Russia has for some years been the lowest cost producer for delivered gas in Europe, which is critical to bear in mind when you think about economic effects. Natural gas markets are not nearly as, as flexible as oil markets. Every part of the equation with natural gas 
involves much more infrastructure investment, and that tends to impede agile responses to price developments or to crises or political direction. In countries like the US, increasing supply involves in considerable investment and increasing LNG exports involves additional extra, uh, very considerable investment. Transport to markets for natural gas is extremely resource intensive, whether it's in the form of liquefied natural gas or piped gas. This means that Europe cannot really live without Russian gas in the short medium term. And that long-term expectations have much more impact on investor decisions which are critical than do short-term potential rewards. This is a very, very investment heavy kind of energy. So why do I put energy in the spillover category? For two reasons. First, this war will likely cause, I think, a kind of whipsaw effect, raising consumption of dirty hydrocarbons like coal in the short term, and I hope accelerating the adoption of green technology in the medium and long term. We haven't yet seen that second long term effect yet. And second, energy is one important sector in which the rest of the world, from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, is really not interested in joining this fight. They don't want to choose sides. They just want to sell what they've got to sell. And that means way more than it did during the Cold War. So finally, I'll say a couple of words about China and the rest of the world. Uh, given China's emergence as a global power and near peer competitor with the United States, as well as Chinese behavior toward Taiwan, there's been a great deal of commentary on what Ukraine means for China. I don't think that is at all clear at this point, and I think maybe it gets almost too much focus, not too little. In my personal opinion, Taiwan is not likely to be the lens through which Beijing and Xi Jinping view this conflict. I would guess that they use a broader strategic framework of how to minimize damage and maximize benefit to Chinese interests. They certainly do not want the United States to emerge stronger and more assertive from this war, that's clear. But contrary to most observers, I think there's a fair chance that China could emerge a winner from this conflict, that its interests will not be seriously damaged and it'll come out relatively unscathed. This is in part because this is basically a European regional conflict. The rest of the world wants to stay on the sidelines. Many of the world's leading countries are not participating in sanctions. I think people realize this. India, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Turkey, South Africa, Nigeria, Brazil, Mexico. These are just a few of the countries that are not participating in the sanctions regime. These are a mixture of democracies and authoritarian regimes and everything in between. I'm not sure that this is really such a big problem for the US. And I would argue against applying secondary sanctions to curtail economic ties between those countries and Russia, but I'm afraid we might do it. And we can discuss that a little bit more later. I think that would be a major mistake from my point of view. In the United Nations General Assembly vote on expelling Russia from the human, human rights, UN Human Rights Council about a month ago, states representing more than two thirds of the global population voted against this resolution or abstained. But this is not evidence of immorality on the part of those countries as some people have alleged, nor a choice to undermine what the US often calls the rules-based international order. These countries are actually following the rules. There are no UN mandated sanctions on Russia, none whatsoever. So they are not obliged by international law to comply. More fundamentally though, they're just doing something that all countries should do. They are upholding their national interest and they're upholding their national sovereignty. That is one of the key principles involved in the Ukraine conflict after all. So I'll just conclude here. I think we need to recognize that this conflict is essentially a European conflict. It is not a global conflict and we should not try to turn it into one. I think we should follow our national interest in the Ukraine conflict. And to my mind, President Biden and his team are doing that fairly well. At least they have until recently, but I am very concerned that they have entertained more and more risk and raised the strategic state stakes uh, over the last month or two in keeping with depressing and dysfunctional habits of the American and foreign uh, American defense and foreign policy establishment. Too many com commentators, I think, use imperative language to describe what the US 
must do in Ukraine. We must supply heavier weapons or weapons that can reach Russia. We must accept Ukraine into the European Union or NATO. We must take more risks on behalf of freedom. But this is not right. Uh, foreign affairs is not the place for moral imperatives. They just are not really very relevant. America has choices and we should choose wisely in light of our very troubled history at war over the past two decades and in light of the various serious problems we have at home. After all, it's perhaps worth noting that there were just uh, 21 people killed in an elementary school yesterday in Texas. We need to heal ourselves and we cannot pretend that we can uh, lead the world and at the same time neglect what needs to be done at home. Um, I will stop here. There is more I could say. I hope that there are interesting questions. I hope I've stimulated some, um, some thought. I think this is a very important topic, but I do think we need to keep it in perspective. Uh, we are not in this war and we should not want to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You covered some very interesting territory there and it raises a lot of additional questions. You know, one thing I'd like you to return to just briefly, you, you touched on it, but ironically, in a way, uh, in 6061, the U.S. became very concerned when Russia was shipping missiles and potentially nuclear weapons into Cuba, right on our doorstep. And as you pointed out, uh, in more recent years, NATO has uh, posted troops not that far from the Western border has talked about having uh, missile defense or offense in the minds of Russians, offense systems close to their Western border. Uh, there's something ironic about this. And, and I'm wondering, do you think the US has any fault because of its encouragement of Ukraine joining NATO and, and the way in which we've approached things with NATO, have we actually been partly at fault for this invasion by Russia of the Ukraine? I think we have. Uh, of course, it's the, the fault or the responsibility or the blame is not the same as Putin has. He was the one who pulled the trigger. But we created the conditions to, to some degree that led to this conflict. This is a highly controversial point of view in the United States, by the way. But I think people who claim that Russia cannot feel threatened by NATO because NATO, we uh, assert, is not threatening to Russia, just don't understand the nature of threats. There's a concept that's very common in the study of international affairs, and it's called a security dilemma. And what a security dilemma means is that countries have different perceptions of, of threats and risk. And when one country takes measures in order to sort of increase its own sense of security, it can trigger a sense of insecurity in its partner. And that's how you tend to get these kind of escalating uh, situations of increasing armament and tension. I think we really unlocked a security dilemma in Eastern Europe with the way that we handled the uh, enlargement of NATO. We didn't seem to care. I was in NATO during the time when uh, I arrived shortly after the accession to NATO of the first three Central European uh, new members, uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. And I was there for the accession of seven more members, the largest in, uh, enlargement that we had. And I'm not, I have no objection to any of those members joining, and I think we now are obliged to defend them like all other NATO member states. However, the, by doing that, by welcoming them, we, we did it several things. First of all, we re reinforced Russia's suspicion of NATO, that it was threatening, that it was encroaching on their borders. But we also became in a way more threatening to Russia. When we, the United States in particular, I think, began to adopt the attitude toward uh, Russia of the new member states, particularly Poland, um, but also the Baltics after the Baltic states joined uh, the European Union and NATO in 2004. We, we became advocates for their point of view in NATO. We would try to corner France and Germany and Spain and Italy and push them to adopt the view of Russia that was held by, uh, by Poland and, 
the Czech Republic and the Baltic states. So we actually did nothing in a way to um, sort of ameliorate Russian concerns that this threat was real. And then the handling of Ukraine's uh, sort of prospective membership in, in NATO has been a disaster in this regard. Um, we have always sought to develop, um, to sort of encourage the uh, consolidation of, uh, of governments in Ukraine that are essentially hostile to Moscow. I mean, we've described it as sort of containing or eliminating undue or uh, corrupt Russian influence in Ukraine, but the effect is, the practical effect is the same. And uh, I think that the immediate run up to this invasion involved intensifying security cooperation between the United States and Ukraine, which clearly amplified the, the view in Russia that, um, that this was a threat. Now, Putin's own behavior may be something slightly different, but many, many uh, scholars of uh, Russian affairs uh, told us back in, 19, in the 1990s and then later that what we were doing was going to provoke an intensely hostile reaction from Russia if we were not careful. This includes, of course, uh, George Kennan, perhaps the most uh, famous American uh, sort of thinker about our strategy toward Moscow back in the middle of the uh, last century, but also in the 1990s, who warned against NATO enlargement. It includes, um, who else? Um, Jack Matlock, Ronald Reagan's ambassador to Moscow, argued hard against NATO enlargement. It includes many other scholars today, some of whom are gadflies like John Mearsheimer, some of whom are very, very serious like Stephen Wald. Um, I think it was a mistake. We, we should have tried harder to avoid this situation. Thanks for those comments. You know, I'd, I'd like to, to go back to the within Russia realities. I mean, we, we see, certainly if we were paying attention on our own news and being objective at all about it, we know that there's a lot of um, play to the domestic audience in the United States on this matter. Um, and I think that's universally true probably around the world that there's domestic audiences, the supreme concern audience for everybody, whether they're autocratic or otherwise, but certainly in Russia, that's, that's the case. And I, I want to just quickly observe a couple of things from my experience there, and I certainly they've been covered well at other times too. One is the absolute anxiety of Russia that, that they could once again be invaded by, by something like the Nazi invasion. I mean, Russia, when you go to Russia, as many as have had a chance to do, and you see like in what was Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, a massive, massive uh, cemetery where, where so many of the residents of that city died during the time it was under siege. And what, 20 million plus Russians died in that war. Russians really know about and fear war in general. They don't want war. Now, understand there's a war going on that was perpetrated by their invasion, but generally there's just a feeling that war is not a good thing. Uh, that's a high value there. There is uh, a fear of the West and I, I noticed the term, and I'd like you to comment on this, about denazification as one of the reasons why Russia is, invaded the Ukraine and is fighting this war. Uh, it is easy to quickly say in Russia anything about Nazis, and that will arouse immediate anxieties in that country. And it sort of melds together that domestic population in a stronger support for whatever action is taken outside Russia to protect Russia. Can you say anything about, is there any Nazification that really exists in the Ukraine? And if so or not, what, what light can you shed on that? Well, this is a little out of my area of specialization, but I will say a couple of words about it because I think it is important. 
First, I, I think it is fair to say that uh, Putin's invocation of denazification as a justification of the war is wrong. I mean, he has certainly distorted the facts in order to um, appeal to Russian sentiment, but in fact, the risk of Nazification or the notion that Nazis were in charge of uh, the Ukrainian government is wrong. However, he can find some evidence of um, sort of influential uh, extreme right sort of neo-Nazi groups that have existed in Ukraine since the 1990s and became prominent during the Euromaidan protests, for example, in 2014. Um, there's an incident that I think is basically forgotten in the West, but I think is remembered in Russia, in uh, Odessa, where uh, people uh, affiliated with the Azov Battalion, the unit or one of the main units of the Ukrainian armed forces that was defending Mariupol in that very long siege and was holed up in the Azov steel plant, that people affiliated with that organization were, I think, very credibly charged. I don't know if there was ever any, uh, ever a trial, were very credibly charged with killing dozens of Russians uh, in Odessa in the aftermath of the Euro Maidan protests in Kiev. So there is a sense that. Uh, there is an issue uh, with extreme Ukrainian chauvinism, which does kind of bleed over into neo-Nazism and so forth. This is generally a problem, by the way, in uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, the existence of neo-Nazi groups. I mean, we also have some here, needless to say, not very far from us in some cases in the Idaho panhandle and so forth. But um, it is a bigger political issue in uh, the, these countries that were uh, sort of formerly in uh, the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact. Um, and I guess uh, the second thing I would say is that um, we do need, this is a contest essentially over the notion of Ukrainian nationality or Ukrainian nationalism. And when you start to talk about nationalism and the development of nations, often there are extremists involved. This happens to have occurred in distant past in most of Western Europe, so it's not remembered very well. Um, but uh, the creation of nations uh, and the strengthening of national sentiment often involves violence against um, others. This, I, I worked in Greece for a very long time. The Hellenization of Northern Greece was a violent procedure. Um, often it involved war, but it also involved oppression. So the, um, uh, this is something that I think is not correct as a sort of characterization of the Ukrainian government under Volodymyr Zelensky, but uh, does sort of um, resonate with certain facts about the development of Ukraine over the last 30 years. One, one other thing I'd like to mention uh, from my observations in my couple of years uh, living with Russians is this, there is a deep sense of remorse about the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, people there feel like it's the worst thing that's ever happened. And uh, they, there really is a desire uh, to restore Russia's importance and presence in the world. And they may not, they may believe that that's out of a respect as opposed to the power of the thumb, but and you know we know that there's various things about that. But bottom line is they really uh, grieve the loss of the for, former Soviet Union. Putin certainly plays on that, uh, and and it's perhaps just part of his strategy to actually try to reinstate some of that, but. The fact that the United States, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, literally dismissed Russia, just ignored them, said, oh, that's over. They're not, they're not an important country anymore. That also is felt very deeply in Russia as a, a rejection and a disrespect for them and their long history. Yeah, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. I think. We need to be more careful about our use of language, not the average American, but the American leadership. Yeah. Um, I am afraid when, I, I, I tend to agree with 
President Biden's assertion that Vladimir Putin is a thug, but I do not agree with that President Biden should call Vladimir Putin a thug. The, um, the you know, this is, this, there are larger things at stake for us when you call foreign leaders uh, sort of derogatory names. First of all, it rarely gets you anything. It appeals only to domestic sentiment. But the, um, but the problem is you can actually alienate to an unnecessary degree um, the other side and you can make it harder to find solutions. I mean, look, just look at the, um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis as another very critical moment. The two leaders, Khrushchev and Kennedy, did not call each other nasty names during those days of incredible, fateful tension. Um, there is just no reason for it. it is, it's a indicative of a total lack of discipline in terms of the way that we talk about others. And it also, I think, evinces a huge lack of respect. I mean, it's not just Russians that don't feel respected, it's us who don't respect them. And that I think uh, we're, we're not, there's no kind of murky cynicism to cut through here. They are catching our drift and our drift is um, you're less than us. You're just less than us. And in fact, we'd like you to be even weaker than you are Yeah. by an expression of federal policy or direction. Um, Christine Perkins, I'm gonna just check in with you to see if there are questions that we should be looking at right now. Uh, Certainly, we have a number of questions and they are wide ranging. And so if you're ready, I'd like to just jump right into some of them. Great, sure. Super, uh, starting at the, the beginnings, the roots of this particular conflict, do you believe our decisions in Syria and Afghanistan help led to Putin's decision to invade? Uh, I wouldn't think Afghanistan was particularly pertinent. Syria, maybe, um, uh, because Syria, uh, but and perhaps not in exactly the way that some would suggest. I don't think it was our lack of uh, enforcement of Obama's red line that um, that prompted maybe Putin to sit up and pay attention. It was, um, I think. The capacity that Putin had to assert a role for Russia in the support uh, for the Assad regime uh, effectively in the face of weak U.S. objections. I don't think we should have gone in, by the way. I don't think we did anything wrong with regard to Syria. So I don't think my, my claim that there's a link between these things is not to say that if we just sort of deployed American troops absolutely everywhere, we would all be safer. The um, uh, the, I've even written papers that we did exactly the right thing in Syria and we should not cry too much about it, even though it was a humanitarian disaster. The, um, but I do think that the, the ability of Putin to uh, effectively assert Russian military in, uh, sort of influence in Syria and in Libya uh, did uh, increase his appetite for more military uh, sort adventures and may have contributed to his willingness to invade Ukraine. Okay. You uh, characterize Putin as a, um, a bad man, not a madman, and also said that the risk of escalation and a wider conflict, including uh, nuclearization, is, is significant concern to you. How would you rate the actual likelihood of Putin or others in Russia resorting to nuclear um, attacks? I don't know if I could put a percentage on it, for example. I don't think that would be prudent or wise or even maybe possible. I do think it's growing. Um, I, I think as we press our, uh, our case, I guess, as, as Ukraine succeeds against Putin and we nonetheless move to give Ukraine more and more in order to, I think now, defeat Putin. That, that is a, there's a lot of discussion of the need to defeat Russia in Ukraine. This is widely discussed in the media. You get very senior international and American officials speaking openly about it. Um, you know, you get uh, sort of prime ministers and former prime ministers saying, Russia must come out of this humiliated, for example. Um, then I think we are, uh, 
increasing the risk of escalation of this war. Um, you, you know, you, you can, one, one outcome would be total victory. You know, what we always loved about the world, Second World War, total victory. We've never achieved it since, and we ought not to dream that it's going to happen in this case. Um, the uh, fact is, this will not be a total victory. Even Volodymyr Zelensky said it's going to end at the negotiating table. But we don't want it to end at the negotiating table after a nuclear device has been set off in Kharkiv, for example. What is the point of that? We, we need to bear in mind that the risks of escalation are serious. And if Russia feels as though it has fewer choices, they will be growing. So we need, as much as we might be morally sort of reluctant to do so, we need to help find a way to get uh, an off-ramp off for Vladimir Putin from this war. Not regime change, not revolution in Moscow, but an off-ramp for this bad man, Vladimir. Okay. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, although the media may have, have been painting a picture that there's a unified global response in response to the Ukraine invasion, most countries outside the North Atlantic space, with exception of Japan and Taiwan, haven't signed on to the sanctions. How, yeah. would you, how should we think about the Global South's refusal to take sides in this conflict? I think we should think about it a lot, first of all. We should, first of all, recognize it and think about it. Um, I think what we're doing at the moment is the wrong thing. We're thinking about how to compel them to join in the sanctions. So uh, let me first say what I think we should do and then say what we shouldn't do. We should recognize that countries, uh, many of them uh, who have don't, do not have the resources that the United States does, are suffering more from these sanctions than we are. I mean, they're not participating in these sanctions, but they are suffering more of the consequences of these sanctions, and more broadly speaking, of the war. There is widespread fear, and I think fully justified, that we could have more victims of starvation and malnutrition uh, in the next several years than we've had in decades on, on this planet. And it's not only because of climate change, which I think we might want to come around to at the end as a big priority that might be in competition with uh, global confrontation with authoritarian regimes, but um, the uh, but it's not only because of that. It's because of the massive price effects and shortages that have been created by this war, not just by the war, but by the sanctions regime. We need to bear that in mind. Our sanctions are contributing significantly to this famine. We have sanctions on Russian uh, fertilizer exports, for example. We have sanctions on Russian wheat exports. So this has just compounded the effect of the sort of Russian embargo on, on Black Sea ports of Ukraine. So we are not helping, we are hurting. So the, um, and it's true for many of these uh, sanctions that what looks like a acceptable cost to us, and we are of course the ones who like the sanctions, is an unacceptable cost to others. And they are trying to evade those costs. We should not make it harder for them. That would be like a perverse uh, sort of, uh, sort of transfer of the costs of our own policy onto those who are least uh, able to support it. So I'm worried that we're going down this track. What are we doing that's wrong? We're beginning to study how to apply secondary American sanctions to oil imports from Russia. Um, India, for example, has increased its imports of Russian oil, so has Turkey. So we want to punish all of the organizations that are involved in those imports, even though those are not UN sanctions. Those are American sanctions or G7 sanctions or EU sanctions. So these countries are in no way legally obliged to uphold them. They are, however, susceptible to the, uh, the power of the American dollar, which is how we usually go about imposing sanctions uh, or imposing punishments on those who do not support our sanctions. That is what has made our, um, our sort of maximum pressure campaign on Iran both so effective, if you want to call it that, and so disastrous. Thank you. Looking at comparisons between the situation in Ukraine and uh, Taiwan, Biden made some recent comments about Taiwan, although those were walked back by the State Department. 
um, which seems to indicate that the Ukraine invasion has led the Biden administration considering shifting away from American policy of strategic ambiguity in Taiwan. Are we headed into another bifurcated world order? Um, what's your take? I think that's where Joe Biden wants to go. I, I don't know why. I, I, well, I like the guy reasonably well. I think he's doing a decent job on many um, issues, including in his management of the Ukraine conflict per se. But this um, uh, drive to toward a new Cold War and the constant moralistic preaching about the need of countries to choose sides between the bastion of democracy America and its coalition of democratic regimes and uh, the bad guys, you know, she and Putin sort of in the same basket is, is I think, an attempt to create this dynamic in global affairs. Um, a lot of people like it. Uh, a lot of uh, foreign affairs scholars have really glommed onto it. Um, there's a there's a bad or sort of a derogatory name for the foreign affairs establishment, the blob. And I think the blob, uh, it was kind of... Uh, Cohen by an official in the um, in the Obama White House um, because they didn't like the blob. The blob is is kind of the policy side of the military industrial complex. In all honesty, I hate to be using these kind of kind of maybe overworn um, terms, but that's what the blob is. And they tend to value assertive and con confrontational approaches to international problems, often heavily militarized approaches to international problems. Um, and I think that unfortunately, that is where this rhetoric is headed. I don't think it has much appeal though, and I think it's likely to fail. Um, this is a world in which uh, countries like Turkey, South Africa, India, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, and Mexico count for a lot more than they did back in the 1950s when we were so wrapped up in our own notions of the Cold War and ideological confrontation with Soviet communism. First of all, the other side, authoritarianism, is, is not an ideology that is shared widely and has a kind of messianic approach to global transformation and revolution. It's just not the same. But we seem to like it to be the same. You know, as much as we love Churchill and hate Neville Chamberlain, we love the Cold War. The Ameri the blob just loved the Cold War. And uh, they would they learn they yearn for a return of Cold War relations because they simplified international engagement for the United States. Unfortunately, it also gets in the way of addressing everything that we really need to address in the world, like climate change and pandemic disease and the gap in wealth between the global south and the global north and all these things. But they are really focused on this this kind of ideological rationalization of American hegemony. I, now I sound like a Marxist, but I kind of almost am on this thing. It's, <laughs> it's extreme. So uh, would you say that there's, uh, there's an interest in imposing some sort of a NATO style security arrangement in East Asia as a result of the blob or, or anyone else, this philosophy? I think there's a desire. They would love to see it. There would have been advantages some years ago, I think, to trying to build such an uh, uh, arrangement, but the countries themselves have always had too much mutual suspicion. You know, South Korea, for example, and Japan have not had smooth relations over the last 50 years. Um, so it's been it's not been possible for that reason. The number of players is also very limited. However, this fascination with the Quad, you know, and I say this right after uh, President Biden just had a big meeting of the Quad out in uh, his Asia trip. Um, it, it just shows how flimsy this this uh, um, effort is. I'm not saying ignore the quad or abolish the quad, utilize the quad for some things, but a uh, a kind of scheme that is built around the United States, Japan, Australia, and India is just not realistic. First of all, India is not in. I mean, they're in the quad, but they're not in this philosophy of of containment of China and and sort of global democratic sort of crusade against authoritarianism. We've seen that on uh, in Re India's reaction to uh, our efforts to get them to join us on Russia sanctions. So we, we just need to accept more of reality. We need to adjust to a world in which our influence is relatively diminished, not pretend that we are going to, through a force of will and more military commitment, create a world in which we're once again unipolar um, sort of hegemon. Christine, can I? 
Can I interject something here as a follow-up? Sure. Um, and that has to do with this global food crisis, which you have mentioned, alluded to, and is certainly being talked about and becoming more apparent. Uh, assuming that the Black Sea ports of the Ukraine don't become available, there's some like 20 million tons of grains and other foods uh, stored already there, much of which is just going to rot or be wasted if we don't do something with it. So tying that in with the NATO question and going back to uh, Finland and Sweden's possible admission, they would not have to be members of, of uh, NATO for this to happen. But I'm, I understand that those now trapped foodstuffs could possibly be moved north and shipped out of Baltic um, ports and mm -hmm. get into the world su food supply so they're not lost entirely. Can you shed any light on what could emerge in that regard, traveling through Europe with these foodstuffs instead of going through the Black Sea? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible that a large portion, I don't think nearly enough, but some large portion could be diverted to go through ports on the Baltic Sea or let's say the North Sea. Um, uh, it's just sort of into the European um, uh, sort of logistic uh, uh, net, uh, which has a lot of capability, although it's not particularly well developed in adjacent areas to Ukraine. But uh, nonetheless, they could move uh, some of it in that direction. I think another possibility, as unrealistic as it might appear right now, is to try to negotiate an arrangement through the UN that Russia would support. It, it's not absolutely impossible, you know, that. Russia could accept a scheme that would lift the embargo on its uh, exports. It, it, is, it, is, it is kind of embargoed its own exports in, in part as a reaction to international sanctions. So there is a degree of Russian complicity in restricting access internationally to Russian exports. But um, they could, uh, you could find some kind of arrangement perhaps where that both Ukraine and Russia could have some kind of strictly controlled uh, arrangement through, let's say, uh, Odessa or Mariupol even, uh, to export this grain to the world market and something to do, some, some mechanism for handling the revenues in the, at least the short term so that they're not perceived to be helping one side or the other in the conflict. This, this could be done, I think. Uh, it's the kind of thing that in the past we would have tried to do. But um, unfortunately, I, uh, I, I don't think there's any desire to, for us to lead this effort. We've shown so little interest in negotiated uh, arrangements that could somehow ameliorate the effects of this conflict or shorten this conflict. It's a bit depressing. After an initial flash of excitement about the efforts by the uh, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett or uh, Erdogan in Turkey to support negotiations. We've lost interest in negotiations, I think. And in fact, we've begun to criticize negotiations, as has Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, I'm not putting the blame entirely on the Ukrainian side. In fact, most of the blame is on the Russian side, but we should be pushing for negotiations. So what, what could, you mentioned off-ramps before. What, what are some possible off-ramps that could, um, really ramp down this or tamp down this war or end it completely? What are some possibilities and who would be making the decisions about whether these off ramps would get used? Um, well, um, it's hard. I mean, it's gonna be difficult to find off ramps. Granted, this conflict has evolved in a way that makes it harder. I think a, a heavy push toward a ceasefire would be the first one. And we've seen that under certain circumstances, ceasefires have been arranged. For example, there was a ceasefire arranged in the vicinity of Mariupol shortly before it really collapsed and fell to uh, the Russian forces. So ceasefires or rather short-term humanitarian arrangements are typically where you begin because both sides have an interest in, in uh, them typically in the heat of conflict to take a pause, uh, especially if there are arrangements in place that, that limit the ability of the sides to take uh, sort of tactical advantage of those situations. So usually, and it's also good to agree on something. It, it's very helpful to first agree on something. Anyway, uh, beyond that, I think the Ukrainians early on laid out a set of negotiating objectives for their talks with Russia. 
that were realistic. They've since kind of walked away from them. They claim that it's because of, of the uh, atrocities in Bucha and elsewhere, but I don't buy that. I, I just don't find any link between your, the objectives that you have in a conflict and the atrocities committed by the other side. This is not a, you're not talking about a moral uh, conclusion of the war or a kind of uh, a sort of uh, imposition of the moral sort of consequences of a war when you talk about negotiation. That's just not what happens. So if you're negotiating, you're trying to protect your interests and both sides do have an interest, uh, I think sufficient interest to work on things that, um, a sufficient interest in short, shortening this conflict and sorting out the consequences that should enable them, I would hope, to negotiate on some things. So one of the things that um, was in uh, the Ukrainian demands uh, or, or position was that they would be willing to accept sort of internationally supervised neutrality with international guarantees um, and uh, then they would forego their membership application to NATO and they would accept that they would never be an ally in NATO. That I think should be on the table still. And that's probably going to be something that satisfies to a certain degree uh, Russian demands. There are probably territorial demands that Russia will have. But I saw this morning, for example, that Zelensky said they can't even talk until Russia backs away from all the territory that it's taken um, during the current uh, conflict, so since the 24th of March, 2022. Well, um, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. Countries don't do that. So the, um, that, that is gonna be on the table. That'll have to be negotiated. But I think there are a series of these things that would be more uh, realistic if we were pressing for negotiation. If, if, you know, other countries have pressed for negotiation, just mainly not us. The, um, France, Germany, Italy, all very much want this to be negotiated. Now you can say they are you know, part of the problem, but why should the United States, given our geographic position, be more deeply sort of, uh, sort of dug in like the Poles and the Lithuanians rather than the Germans, the French and the Italians? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So, we should, I think, review our own position on, on negotiation and press much more uh, vigorously for uh, negotiation. And Turkey's facilitation of uh, potential negotiations, how do you see that? Great. I mean, you know, I, I said that Vladimir Putin is not a madman, but a bad man. I would say, you know, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is also a bad man, but he's not a madman. So, um, you know, we should take advantage of that. We should take advantage of any arrangement, even Xi Jinping. We should, I think, consider whether or not we can enlist uh, more support from China for something that concludes the war. We're not going to get them to punish Russia, but a, they want the war to end. So why don't we take advantage of that? We are extremely blinkered in our approach. I think we're terribly ideological. And uh, I think we've kind of been, you know, we're, uh, getting high on our own supply, if you ask me. Um, we need to back away from our ideological commitment and think in more realistic terms about how to conclude this conflict. Christine, I, I sort of cut you off at some of your questions. There's a bunch from the audience, so let Sorry. me jump back in. Um, so far, the U.S. Uh, involvement has been primarily financial. Do you support the recent $40 billion investment in arms to support Ukraine? Yeah, I don't think we're actually investing $40 billion in the arms, though, but no. um, at, at least not directly in terms of arms in Ukraine. But I do support most of our arms assistance to Ukraine. I do think we need to uh, be careful about um, uh, which arms we send to Ukraine. We, for example, do not want, I think, to see the Ukrainians take the fight to the Russians. Um, you know, and that's one reason why reporting on what might be attacks inside Russia on uh, mainly infrastructure facilities has been treated so quickly and, and sort of obliquely in the, in the media, because in fact, I think some attacks have happened. The Ukrainians have not claimed responsibility and we would not want to have to back that kind of thing up. Um, so I think by we have increased the lethality and the reach of the weapons that we're providing to Ukraine. And I think we need to keep a close handle on that. 
I'm, we do not want to arm Ukraine for victory, I'm afraid. I, I hate to say this, but uh, uh, a sort of crashing Ukrainian victory would not necessarily be good for us. I, it's, it seems morally unjustifiable, but something that forces Russia so into a corner that it decides to widen or escalate the war may not be in our interest. The, um, so we need to be careful on that score. I think we've also, by the way, shared intelligence with them, which has become a sensitive issue um, because of leaks, but also I think because of the nature of the intelligence that we're sharing, which may be dangerous. Um, I uh, think intelligence sharing is, is very important uh, to what we're doing and we have obviously handled it mainly well, but I think we need to be a little bit careful. And um, also economic support, you know, because the Ukrainian government has almost no revenues now, we're, we're providing massive economic support as part of our uh, $40 billion latest package. And um, I suppose we need to reconcile ourselves to the need to provide that for, uh, for at least many months to come. In the, in the event that the hostilities do cease, should Russia pay the cost of rebuilding Ukraine? I think that's a matter for negotiation. Um, clearly, you know, I, I just, I don't want to sound amoral, but uh, we need to think more about uh, sort of preserving as much as we can of Ukraine and um, sort of providing for a better outcome in the end than we do about punishing, uh, pun punishing the perpetrators. Uh, this is not like a, uh, you know, global international affairs and international law do not operate in any way like domestic affairs and domestic law. not at all. There is no enforcer in international affairs. So um, if we do not win a total victory over Russia or Ukraine doesn't win a total victory over Russia, the issue of what to do with those responsible for this uh, invasion will be um, left uh, for later for negotiation. By the way, um, I mean, I hate to be a real uh, critic of the United States, but we launched a, an illegal invasion of Iraq and we're not paying for the re reconstruction of Iraq. Um, we helped to destroy Afghanistan and we're now embargoing funds that would otherwise be available to the government of Afghanistan that are needed to feed its people. So I think uh, the idea that the person responsible for damage will pay for it in the international scheme of things. We would have a big bill on our desk that we would have to pay for if we were to do that. Vietnam is another case. The, um, there, we have gone around the world sowing a lot of destruction and nobody seems to be saying, well, the United States needs to get into a reparation scheme in order to account for this. True. Um, speaking of consequences of our actions, <laughs> uh -huh. um, what are potential consequences of supplying weapons to Ukraine with relatively little oversight? Is arms trafficking post-war of concern? I think it probably is, although less than it has been in other cases at this point. We were worried at one point that we would be supplying weapons to an insurgent um, campaign against Russia uh, because it was feared early on that the Ukrainian armed forces would be um, defeated by Russian armed forces, and that therefore you would have an insurgency. And that would have been a huge issue with regard to control of, of uh, force of the weapons. But right now, I think their weapons transfers are going to the properly constituted armed forces of Ukraine. And I think the risk of of uh, of getting out of control is relatively low. Um, the kinds of weapons that we're providing, stingers, for example, were the kind that we provided to the Mujahideen. These are newer stingers and better stingers, but those are the kind that we provide to the Mujahideen uh, back in the uh, struggle against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan in the 1980s. And um, those did get out of control and they were showing up all over the place. And some of them did shoot down civilian aircraft. So we do need to be worried um, but I think as long as we are supplying them to the Ukrainian armed forces and they remain integrated and, and capable of managing and accounting for them, we should be okay. Okay. Do you um, tie any relationship between the uh, loss of President Trump um, to the likelihood of invasion of Ukraine? Not really. Um, uh, because already under the Trump administration, we had begun to provide lethal assistance to Ukraine, which I think helped um, spur Putin to want to invade. Um, but our policy 
was a mess uh, with regard to Ukraine during the Trump administration, but it didn't really go off in a different direction. The official policy basically never changed. Um, and, uh, you know, Trump was a kind of chaos factor in terms of the execution of that policy, but he didn't really define a different policy. Um, he did have a different relationship with Vladimir Putin than Joe Biden has, that's for sure. But I don't think that uh, Biden, I don't think that Putin was so invested in his relationship with uh, Trump that he would have somehow held off invading or done anything different uh, with regard to this situation. Okay. So apparently yesterday, the New York Times reported from Davos remarks by Henry Kissinger ceding territory to make peace with Russia. Negotiations need to begin in the next two months before it creates upheavals and tensions that will not be easily overcome. Dividing line should be a return to the status quo ante. Pursuing a war beyond that point would not be about freedom of Ukraine, but a new war against Russia itself. Do you agree or disagree with Dr. Kissinger? I sometimes hate to say I agree with Dr. Kissinger, but uh, I do, in this case, agree with Dr. Kissinger. Um, I, uh, I hate to say it because I think um, the some of the things he did in the past, in particular the um, extension of the uh, Vietnam War into Cambodia were ghastly um, sort of disasters. But um, uh, in this case, I agree with him. I think he is uh, representing exactly the kind of realist approach to foreign policy, which is a kind of foreign policy philosophy, which I embrace. And I think that we do need to be cautious that as this war grinds on, I think the impulse on our side is strong to escalate, to be honest, and to, to and to look at war and to begin fighting what is clearly a proxy war against Russia on the territory of Ukraine. Okay. How about um, the difference between truth and disinformation in mm -hmm. the world that is now emerging? Uh, and I would apply this broadly. Uh, we, we know that that Putin's style is very much reflective of his own formerly KGB, now FSB background, uh, in which plausible deniability was a real tool. You know, you, you make sure to wave in whether you do it yourself or get someone else, you know, social media or something else to put some things on the table so that you, if you get sort of caught um, in doing too much, that you could expect exercise plausible denial. Oh, that wasn't really us, or we weren't doing those kinds of things. What, how do you assess the use of technology and truth and, and disinformation through media as, as tools on either or both sides on this conflict? Well, that's a really difficult question, I have to say. The, um, uh, you know, I had some experience during my career in, in countering Russian or Soviet at the time, uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, including back when I was in East Berlin. And I, I, I think then the, the whole scheme was simple. Now it's become extremely complex. The, um, uh, and uh, as much as we worry about uh, Russian disinformation and the ability to sort of stovepipe an entire national population based on control of the flow of information uh, using technology like is happening with Russia. Uh, very, you know, there's a certain critical mass that is needed for alternative points of view to get through. And if it doesn't, if it's not achieved, then you have basically a compliant population which supports your policy. That, that is a huge factor, I would say, in Russia and China in particular in, in the modern world in terms of major players. What we have in the United States, I'm afraid, is something different but strangely similar. Um, I think the coverage of this conflict has been, I, I think, intensely emotional. The um, now, and I'm, I'm not saying that these things, these atrocities, for example, that are occurring, are not uh, uh, sort of should not be met with an emotional response. However, um, these are consequences of war in many cases, and we've decided to to raise this particular conflict to a level of sort of moral engagement 
for the American population through our media, which I think tends to cloud our judgment. The, um, you know, Americans, many of them, based on this coverage, believe that we're in this war, that this is our war. They feel that victims of a bombing in Kharkiv or Mariupol are somehow like as important to them as victims of a shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Um, that's strange, and I think it's wrong. The um, uh, We didn't have the same concern about the victims of the Yemen conflict or the victims of the Afghanistan conflict or Syria or, or, or Iraq. There is something about this conflict, many people have a guess, I'm not gonna go there, but there is something about this conflict that is being, I think, in a way, let's say not manipulated, but instrumentalized to, to deepen Americans emotional engagement in the, in the war. And that, I think, is clouding our judgment. We need to be very cautious about it. This is a war like many other wars. Wars have victims. We should be more focused on the need to avoid war and to stop war and to contain war and less on the sort of moral imperative to avenge victims of war. This is not, this is not a sensible place for Americans to be in this conflict, in my view. Well, you know, you've given us some very interesting things both to chew on, to think about, and uh, to inform our own evaluation of this, these circumstances that we're facing in this area. I'd like to uh, thank you, first of all, Christine, for helping field audience questions. I hope we got to most of them. And to Ambassador Koenig, thank you so much for coming back to Bellingham City Club. Uh, we look forward to... Uh, possible future engagements with you, but hopefully on some other kinds of topics, uh, but still of equal importance. Uh, I think with that, uh, Christine, unless you have anything else, I think we should uh, probably close up shop here. Sure, just a reminder that in June, on June 22nd, we'll have a program, Medical Equity or Private Equity. Will Wall Street be running our healthcare system? So we hope you'll join us for that presentation in June. Thanks so much again to uh, Ambassador Koenig, and thanks, Tim, for a great presentation today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.